Good morning. My name is Patrick Salvi, Jr., the managing partner of the Chicago office of Salvi Shots and Pritchard, partner of Steiner with Steiner Law. Uh, together, uh, we represent John Doe 1, uh, the first case filed in this Northwestern abuse and discrimination uh, scandal, uh, the details of which we're only beginning to learn. We'll go into some of what we've learned over the last 24 to 48 hours. Uh, we also uh, just recently uh, petitioned the court uh, to file another case with a, a fictitious name, so we're awaiting uh, the court's allowance of filing John Doe 2. Uh, and we will be adding another defendant, which is former athletic director of Northwestern, uh, James Phillips. Thank you. Uh, so that complaint will be filed today. I think what is extremely important for people to understand about the current situation and what we're learning is that the abuse and the hazing and the racial discrimination that took place within the Northwestern Athletic Department is so widespread that it goes well beyond the football program. For a lot of reasons, the football program gets the most attention. But we also know of the toxic culture uh, under baseball coach Jim Foster's uh, reign over the course of the last year. Uh, we've also had discussions with folks that are aware of abuse that took place within the softball program, serious hazing incidents within the volleyball program, uh, and really abhorrent conduct that took place as it related to cheerleaders. Uh, including a lawsuit that was filed in 2021. Uh, and so we are going to continue to take calls from folks uh, that are coming forward uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, really, uh, the, one of the main ones being, despite what happened to these people, a lot of them, outside of their experiences in the athletics, love Northwestern and want to see this stop. And they're obviously joined by the faculty in that endeavor, who are similarly outraged, as we've heard from the press, and now through what is going to be a second investigation, apparently beyond the initial investigation, which we can talk a little bit more about this morning as well. And so facts are coming out uh, really at a uh, very fast pace, uh, and we're learning about the widespread institutional problems that existed within Northwestern. As Pat shared, you know, a number of individuals have tremendous love for the university. Are you really one of the top academic institutions in the world? And we know a number of these players, especially football players, have profound love for Coach Pat Fitzgerald, and we appreciate that. And as Pat shared, this is an institution that permitted this behavior. Sexual harassment, sexual assault, racial discrimination. This is an athletic program that permitted it. And this is a school that allowed it. The complaint that was shared this morning that was filed by a cheerleader identifies how cheerleaders were required to attend social functions with prominent alumni, where they were required to be flirtatious. They were required to socialize with these prominent alumni. And essentially they felt that they were sexually abused and were sexually assaulted. This is an institution that failed their students and failed their student athletes. This isn't just a matter of football players against their coach or against their program. These are students, these are young individuals, these are athletes that are subjected to abuse by an athletic program in a university. And we intend to hold everyone involved accountable. I'll make one other thing that I alluded to a moment ago is this story came about when there was a suspension notice. When the suspension was announced as a result of an investigation purportedly by an outside uh, law firm, although one that we understand to uh, have a close relationship with the general counsel's office at West. And so there's this initial investigation that led to the suspension. We know now that a two week suspension during the NCAA dead period was a completely inadequate punishment for Coach Fitzgerald. It ultimately led to his termination. So one can only wonder 
A, what was contained within the initial investigation report from the outside law firm to the general counsel's office? B, uh, what did the general counsel's office do with it in terms of any edits? And then C, why haven't we seen it? Where is it? We have an executive summary that talks about some bullet points as to what this, uh, what they're going to do going forward. And then, of course, we get the most recent announcement from the university president that they're going to conduct two additional external reviews, clearly uh, indicating that the initial one uh, was inadequate in some way, something that we absolutely have to get to the bottom of as we represent our clients. Having represented survivors of Larry Nasser, Dr. Robert Anderson at the University of Michigan, and looking at other cases like USC, Ohio State, Sandusky. It is unbelievably traumatic to these survivors, these victims, for universities to do delay tactics or to withhold information and fail to be transparent. So we demand that the university, the president, the trustees are transparent with those all of them, these survivors, these victims, and the community and share the full unedited investigation that they're transparent, that these survivors deserve that, that they don't put these survivors through two, three years of waiting for information to be released, that they provide it immediately. At the end of the day, we're talking about, in many cases, 17, 18, 19 year olds. Uh, you can imagine uh, student athletes who excel in the classroom and in sports, we're excited to come to Evanston, Illinois, to be a part of Northwestern and to find out early on uh, that there was a toxic culture in the athletic department that would not respond to complaints and allow behavior like this to continue unchecked. Uh, it's not acceptable, uh, particularly for people uh, who are vulnerable, showing up on campus for the first time. Uh, those are the folks that we represent. And we'll continue to represent and talk to any additional survivors that wish to come forward. We are making that decision. We are now we're in the process of filing our second lawsuit, and we look forward to leaving this litigation and we're more than willing to uh, answer the question. Can you tell us a, a little more about John Doe one or two and what they ignored? Absolutely. So I think the complaint outlines some of the experiences that they uh, witnessed as well as individually uh, encountered. So, for instance, the run of the theater in showers. I don't want to get into the details. I want to protect that with them. But a lot of the reports that have already come out are things that they witnessed and experienced. These are young individuals, and they have very, very close ties still to the university, to their program, to their friends, and they're scared. Um, 21, 22 year olds are very intimidated by a powerful institution like Northwestern and the football program. And they have a lot of love and respect for uh, the coach as well. So they're nervous about coming forward. You understand that. As far as what they've experienced, I think they're still beginning the process. And I think it's really just a shock and an acceptance at this point. For obviously a number of years while they were on the team, they were in this fear. Um, but they're battling right now with guilt, humiliation, shame, fear. And I think over the next years of their lives, and you know, once they um, become adults, you know, into their 30s and 40s, they'll begin to process the traumas and abuse in different ways. Does knowing that there were other victims help them have the courage to come forward with this? And that's why I applaud John Bell one for being willing to file a lawsuit, to letting other survivors of abuse know that they aren't alone. And there's individuals that want to protect them and others that want to take care of them. When, when, when do you guys anticipate um, either other coaches or individual um, teammates who may have been leading some of these uh, incidents to be named? Because so far we know about Pat Fitzgerald, but no one else, even in Northwestern's own investigation, has been identified. So as Pat shared at the start, this is a department and a school that prevented this behavior. That any of them. The culture within the athletic department is to blame here for allowing over a decade of sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, racial discrimination, and so 
the defendant here is the institution. It said by the department, coaches are following the culture that's established by the athletic department, athletic director, and the university. Can you describe some of the racial discrimination that took place? And also, is John Doe um, a racial ethnic minority work? So, racial discrimination, uh, as we understand, is primarily took place in the football program. It's something that was raised with Coach Fitzgerald over the time. Uh, as well as the prior um, uh, athletic department, uh, uh, head of the athletic department, Jim Phillips. Uh, so the details of that, I think, are going to be forthcoming rather than available right now. Uh, but it was widespread to the point where uh, African American players had to have uh, uh, a talk uh, with the coach. And that this was uh, brought to uh, the highest levels within the athletic department. And not address to any satisfaction. Can I ask you about Jim Phillips to elaborate a little bit more? What was it that you learned uh, between now and when the original complaint was filed to suggest that you'll now add him as a defendant? And obviously, you're aware he's currently the commissioner of the ACC. Do you want to comment on whether or not you think that he will be able to properly survive in that position of authority based on what you know? I'm not going to comment on that. That's going to be for others to decide. Uh, but certainly his tenure as athletic department head uh, overlaps with uh, the allegations that have been made. And one thing that was certainly compelling as we spoke to additional uh, athletes uh, before our filing, since our filing uh, yesterday, uh, we've uh, come to understand more as it related to the cheerleading incident. Uh, which took place at some of the highest levels as it relates to uh, alumni, high net worth donors, and that's detailed uh, in that complaint. Uh, we also learned of an incident within the volleyball program that thus far seems to have been swept under the rug. Uh, we know uh, from folks' discussions we had with people that have come forward uh, about problems within the softball program. Uh, and then, of course, there's the baseball program, the best we can tell, uh, because we've not spoken with anybody from the baseball program, is that uh, uh, Coach Foster was fired for creating a toxic culture. But, if, but yet again, the details are not being released, are not being shared. That also speaks volumes. And so as we were contemplating the best path forward for everyone that we represent, it seemed appropriate to uh, sue Jim Phillips. And do uh, reiterate or back off of what Pat just shared. In the last 36 months at Northwestern University, an elite university, you've now had three head coaches terminated for allowing a culture of sexual abuse, harassment, teasing, or racial discrimination. That's just not the football program. That's not just the football coach. That is an athletic department that has permitted, enabled, and tolerated this type of culture affecting young individuals. Okay. That, that, that tells us that it's not just one program. It's not just one coach. It's an athletic department, possibly president, that allowed this culture to go on knowing about it for years and failing to take appropriate action to protect young individuals from very traumatic events in their life. What is it that lets it, allows it to keep happening at the Michigan, Michigan State? That's a great question. So let's look at those cases. You have Nasser, who was at Michigan State for decades, a prominent individual that got to know during his tenure, trustees, presidents, athletic directors, coaches. He was part of that inner circle. Dr. Robert Anderson at Michigan, there for decades, was friends with Bo, family friends with Bo, friends with the Harvard Ball family, friends with Lloyd Carr, friends with presidents, trustees, regents, prominent individuals. So what happens at these mega universities is they protect profits over people, their brand over young individuals. And that's what we're seeing here. Profits over people protecting their brand. And it takes individuals like John Doe want to come forward and lawsuits like this to hold the universities accountable at the highest level. 
When, when do you believe this started in your conversations with the former, like how, how far back is, did you go? As far as the football program, beginning with Fitzgerald started, but I assume that it's been going on far longer than that. Talk a little bit about the conflict of interest. You said the law firm that did the initial investigation on Coach Fitzgerald. Sure. Uh, so this is one of those situations where we very much look forward to discovery uh, because we've already seen fires, but there's more smoke in the distance where we expect more fires to come. Uh, and so what we'll be looking into certainly uh, is the relationship between the law firm Art Fox and the general counsel's office at Western, the various edits that may have run into any investigation that was presented to Northwestern's general counsel and whether or not we're truly getting facts there, what really necessitated subsequent investigations that are now being undertaken. Uh, and so as of right now, uh, we don't know a ton. Uh, we're just uh, talking to folks and trying to gather information so that we can ultimately get provable evidence that we can present in the court. And that's where the discovery process comes in. Uh, but those are some of the things we're going to be looking very, very carefully at. Because one way to perpetuate a toxic culture is to have this outward facade of impartiality. There was a, uh, uh, an investigation done by an outside firm, not by us. Uh, but when at the end of the day, that outside firm ends up being so closely aligned with the institution, uh, that's when you see behavior like this that's allowed to go on for much longer than it should. This needed to be nipped in the bud if it ever even started. So right now you don't know any more about that investigation than what the president shared with the general community? Well, what we do know is that we have an initial investigation that led to a suspension, at which point the uh, university then reneged. And yet to this day, they've not uh, let out the details of that investigation, only the executive summary, which anybody that's read it knows that it's wholly inadequate to provide any sort of details. Uh, all we really see, uh, which we already knew was their position, is that Northwestern said that Pat Fitzgerald didn't know about it, but uh, he should have, essentially, is what it says. Uh, but again, the devil's in the details. And that's what, we need to get. what did you think of the university releasing the executive summary of an investigation into the football team? But we didn't know there was an investigation into the baseball team until after the Tribune and 670 score for more. Now that we're here, we are scratching the surface. We find out about volleyball, we find out about softball. Uh, and then there was the cheerleading incident that got a little bit of press uh, back when it occurred back in 2004, back when the complaint was filed in 2021. It did get a little bit of press, but nothing like this because it wasn't the football program that we're all being honest with. One. So here we are now to put a whole kind of uh, the whole mosaic together where it clearly indicates that there is an entire athletic department and institution. Uh, that allow this behavior. There's, there's been a debate about, especially with coaches, sh you know, should have known versus actually knew. From your interviews and conversations with your uh, your clients, do you have concrete evidence that they absolutely knew about these incidents in any of the sports? We have reports that the football program and coaches were aware of some of the hazy events. Yes. Anything you can add to those, like are these, like from your clients directly, or things that they heard from other people? I have a couple of questions for the webinar. Um, can you tell us how much of the alleged culture originated from Camp Kenosha? And do you foresee any potential criminal charges against individuals? As far as the culture of what took place at the camp, I think it all stems from the culture established within the athletic department by athletic directors. Probably all the way at the top of the Western University. I think that's where the culture begins and then it goes downriver into football program, cheerleading, baseball, volleyball, softball, and probably every single sport because this was a culture that was tolerated and at times encouraged within the athletic department. And if I could add to that, um, one part of the executive summary that stood out, again, very curious as to what the details are is that the uh, camp in Kenosha is, is 
permanently in it. So it must be pretty bad in terms of their own internal investigation in, in addition to what we know from it. Uh, as it relates to any criminal charges, that's not what we do. We're civil lawyers. That's going to be up to others to decide. I don't really have a comment on that. What I can comment is not only do we believe that these student athletes would be entitled to compensatory damages as it relates to uh, what they've gone through, what their individual damages are, but also punitive damages. In Illinois, you get punitive damages in the event a defendant is found to be willful and wanton. In other words, a reckless disregard for the health of others, for the safety of others, a conscious disregard for human safety. And we believe very strongly that that evidence is going to be coming to light in this lawsuit. That we will have an opportunity to see punitive damages because at the end of the day, that's how you effectuate change. If they're not going to do it because it's the right thing to do, then punitive damages, as they're designed to do under the law, serve as a deterrent for Northwestern campus. Can you speak to the current status of the cheerleader lawsuit? So the, the cheerleader lawsuit, even being in existence, is something that I only learned this morning. And so I don't have an update. And, um, can you elaborate on details regarding softball or volleyball incidents, specifically when they occurred or under what coaching leadership? There's only so much that we can share at this time. I mean, we're learning things every single hour and every single day. You know, we're looking at a number of different calls and the individual that sustained the abuse that Brian has been using. Amongst the softball and volleyball programs, it's our understanding that easing was encouraged to the extent um, that individuals quit games, transferred, and no longer wanted to participate in sports, and unfortunately, self harm. As it relates to the volleyball incident, what I can say is there was a serious hazing incident that we were not aware of uh, that appears, uh, and, and we need to follow this investigation to have led to the cancellation of a game. But there's more details that we need to learn before we go any further than that. You may have elaborated on this earlier. Um, in the official complaint, you claim that Pat Fitzgerald took part in the harassment, hazing, bullying, assault, and or abuse of athletes. Can you elaborate on that? As a head football coach, anything that happens on his team ultimately is his responsibility. And what we've seen from other situations like this with football coaches, and what we've heard from individuals that we spoke with, the head football coach knows about everything that happens with his football program. What kids do on summer break, what they do on spring break, what happens in their dorms, but certainly what happens in their locker rooms, on the field, and at camp. There is nothing that a head football coach doesn't know about. And this wasn't just one single event. We're talking about probably hundreds, if not thousands, of events of abuse, harassment, or sexual assault during his tenure. Have you heard from athletes in any other schools since this has come out? Other schools? Other universities where similar behavior may go on in the program? So having represented hundreds of survivors of sexual assault, I can reference with Nasser and with Anderson. I certainly get the welcome of calls from those survivors of abuse that are very proud of what Pat and I are doing and also proud of the survivors like John Bill 1 and 2 that are willing to come forward. But as far as other events of abuse, not of this time. Anyone else? Thank you for covering this very important story. Be sure to update uh, all of your outputs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.